So, uh, um, good evening to all. Thank you for joining tonight's webinar. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to say that I'll be chairing through the medium of Welsh tonight, and Prasor will be presenting in Welsh. So, if you would um, require translation from Welsh to English, at the bottom of your screen, there is the option um, select translation and then select um, English. So, Vesli, Jolch Eto, I'm a Mino Evoni Heno. So, Thank you again for joining us tonight for the webinar um, researching sustainable farming in Wales. My name is Nia Davis and I am the research and development officer for Habiki Cymru. Tonight we'll be hearing from Dr. Prasar Williams. Uh, Prasar is a senior lecturer in environmental management at Bangor University, but is also a beef and sheep farmer. Then joining us as well uh, are two PhD students from Bangor University, Louise McNichol and Joe Jones. Um, so Louise is from Scotland um, and is a graduate of, Gla of Glasgow University uh, and is researching strategies for producing sheep and beef cattle carbon free on Wales's farms. And then Joe is from Ireland and is a graduate of Dublin University. Uh, Joe concentrates on how um, grazing can improve uh, livestock systems. So the order of the night will be that Prasar will start with his presentation, followed by Louise and Joe finally, and then there'll be time left at the end for you, the audience, to ask any questions you may have. And if you have any questions, uh, could you please just put it in the questions box, the chat at the bottom? Uh, so yeah. Uh, that's enough from me. Uh, over to you, Prasad. Thank you very much, Nia. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, letting me make this presentation. Right. Um, I'll just share my screen. There is. Uh, can you see the screen, hopefully, Nia? Can you see that? Okay. Can everyone see it? Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much, Nia, and uh, thank you to Habiki Cymru for the invitation to have this conversation tonight. And um, I thought, well, we've been doing work that you maybe have heard of. Uh, it's had a fair bit of focus just before Christmas in the media, um, where we've been working with Habiki Cymru and Limerick University as well, where we uh, looked at uh, the carbon footprint of 20 farms across Wales and uh, I've got the results of that work to show you tonight to all extents and purposes so we were researching sustainable farming in Wales and I don't know about you but I haven't had supper yet and that lamb at the top there really does look particularly good um, but yeah there we are um, I'd maybe begin at the beginning as it were um, and thinking about, well, why are we here tonight? Why is Sabiki Cymru giving a webinar on uh, sustainability, on carbon footprinting and so on? And I think I'm safe in saying and correct in saying that there is pressure on the red meat sector at the moment. Um, pressure that we haven't seen previously, uh, to all extents and purposes, to receive our environmental effects. Um, it's something that gets a lot, lot of attention uh, at the moment. It's now February, but uh, last month it was January, and uh, some called January Veganuary. Um, and we know during January, particularly, there's a lot of discussion regarding, you know, what's a sustainable diet, how um, how diet affects um, every individual's carbon footprint and so on. So this subject isn't just something that's discussed um, by a, a small cohort or, a, or a, a, a cabal of people. It's something that's discussed on the main news channels, the main newspapers. You know, this is something that is, um, or, or rather this is a conversation that's happening across the country and in reality um, worldwide. We're seeing headlines like the two that we've got in front of us here. Um, 
you know, giving up beef will reduce your carbon footprint more than the cars, says expert. Uh, you know, we're used to these headlines. And of course, we know here in Wales that there's been a lot of discussion relating to the um, nitrate vulnerable zones and so on, and the announcements from the government relating to that. And uh, we're here tonight to talk about carbon more than anything else. But um, I was showing that um, announcement there about the EU nitrates directive, the NVZ, just as another example of the pressure that the sector faces as well, you know, obviously the dairy sector as well, but also the um, the, the meat, the, the, the livestock agriculture sector to reduce our carbon footprint and in reality, other environmental impacts as well. And I don't see this changing at all. Um, it's not something that's just discussed now and in two years, everyone's gonna have forgotten about it. This pressure will increase, it's, it's ramping up every year. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, we must remember, of course, you know, the second point here, where if customers of the red meat sector are worried about uh, what a sustainable diet looks like, they're worried about the environmental effects of meat, if they see these headlines and they hear on the news and on the radio and so on, and on social media, these negative stories, it's obvious that a number of them will start questioning what they eat. And a number of us may have heard over the COVID period that there's been a growth in the sale of red meat. Um, is that all because of COVID? I'm not sure, but we can't avoid the matter either, that there's a lot of people who are reducing how much red meat they eat because they believe that that's the responsible thing to do environmentally. So, you know, this is happening. People are reducing or are even um, giving up uh, the consumption of rest meat because they believe fully that this is the right thing to do. And like any business, any other sector, um, if agriculture doesn't have customers, there's obviously a problem. We have to keep the sector's customers happy or, well, it'll be obvious the implications for that. Um, and of course, we also uh, see pressure from government, um, by, be that uh, Welsh government or the Westminster government. Um, it's only last month that um, Boris Johnson's government discussed the potential of presenting a meat tax. You know, why, um, you know, they were discussing putting a meat tax in place. Well, one of the reasons they said was that this would be the right thing to do in terms of people's health and well-being. Um, you know, like taxing sugar and sweet drinks and so on. But also, it's a big part of this debate that they also said, well, producing red meat has environmental impacts. Someone has to pay for un undoing those effects. And why not tax red meat to do that? And that in turn then means that people will eat less red meat. So, you know, Boris Johnson's government discussed this last month. And I don't know if this is something that will happen in the next few years, who knows, but it is something they're discussing and it's being discussed at a very high level. So it's not something we can ignore. Uh, government are putting pressure on the sector and so are our customers because they're questioning what they're eating. So just doing nothing really isn't an option, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you might disagree, but um, you know, I'm not for one moment saying that I'm right on this, but I don't see either of those two matters changing particularly quickly, you know, pressure from customers or pressure from different governments. It's, um, you know, there are implications for the red meat sector as a result of this and the red meat sector in Wales as a result of this, because doing nothing really isn't an option. So if we look back uh, a few years, uh, eight or nine years ago now, um, Habiki Cymru announced this roadmap. And this was to do with the um, red meat uh, sector's sustainability. This was 2012. Um, since then, 
the discussions moved on and matured quite a bit over the last nine years, I'd say. And by now, um, Habiki Khamri has announced this, which is the Welsh way. Um, and this was their report, which they published before Christmas. And it's quite obvious in reality, if you read uh, the, both dif the two different documents, the, the difference between the two of them in terms of uh, detail, this document is quite a lot more detailed and it reflects the way that the conversations moved on and matured and the way that the challenge has matured as well and the expectations that society places on it. Um, in relation to how the red meat sector will reduce uh, their um, environmental impact. And, you know, in essence, it's quite innovative, isn't it? it it's, it's not just how, it's not just what will we do, it's how will we lead the world in terms of sustainability? How can Wales's red meat sector show everyone else in the world that this is how we do it? Um, and I've quoted uh, in italics up there, the first line in a way, how do we prove it? It's one thing to say, oh yeah, well, you know, eat red meat from Wales because we've got um, one of the most sustainable um, systems in the world. We grow a lot of grass, uh, we've got healthy animals and so on. You know, it's very fertile. Uh, we give nature a lot of consideration. It's great to make these announcements, these proclamations, but we need to prove it or otherwise it's just empty talk. Uh, and that really won't be a benefit to the sector in the end. If people begin to question these claims and begin to ask for proof and that proof simply doesn't exist then it all just falls apart quite quickly. Uh, this is especially important. Um, you know, if we look at uh, the three countries that we compete a lot with, being Ireland on the left here, uh, they've had a programme in place for the agricultural sector for years now. And, you know, Ireland portrays themselves as the most sustainable agricultural nation in terms of meat and milk production. So, you know, Ireland's very close. Um, we import a lot from Ireland at the moment. Uh, Ireland is exceptionally successful in targeting uh, worldwide markets. And one of the strategies they use to ensure access to those new markets is to promote their produce on the basis of sustainability. Then we've got Australia in the middle here, the Meat and, meat and Livestock Australia. And they've got this aim of being carbon neutral in nine years from now. Wow, you know, that's quite a challenge. But it says in 10 points there that you can see what their intentions are and how they're going to reach that point. Australia, again, is one of the main beef producers in the world and you know one of the main lamb producers in the world as well and certainly um, a country that we're going to be competing with increasingly I think in the future. Um, then the last example on the right hand side there uh, this was published in uh, October New Zealand sheep and beef farms shoot close to carbon neutral published in Farmers Weekly and it was a big project that was undertaken in New Zealand. The body responsible for promotion of meat and wool in New Zealand came out and said, listen people, listen world, red meat produced in New Zealand is with the greenest in the world. So almost everyone's on this game. You know, the most important global producers are going around promoting their produce uh, based on sustainability. Um, but of course, this subject isn't a unique conversation to Wales or to Britain. Customers around the world are asking about this and are interested in the sustainability of red meat. So it's one thing to say we're going to be world leading. We need proof to back us up because if we haven't got, other people have. There are people who are always willing to step into the breach, as it were. Uh, so where are we at with the Welsh way? Well, I've tried to outline this in five points. And we, first of all, have to see where we're at now, I'd say. 
we may as well not uh, have these um, big targets that we may not be aiming this high unless we know where we are now. So that's a good starting point, I'd suggest. And from that point, you can say, right, well, what changes can we make? What opportunities have we got? Um, you know, very similar to that list that Australia published, we need a list for ourselves here in Wales so that um, we can see what the uh, red meat sector can do differently, techniques we can adopt, and that will help us in our aim of being world leading by the end. And then, you know, it's one thing, know where we are. Second thing, see where the opportunities are. Third, we need those opportunities to become a reality. It's empty talk to say, oh, well, we could do this, but then not do it. So there are a lot of uh, barriers in, in place, but how do we get around those barriers? Why isn't it happening already? So that's exceptionally important. The fourth point, by learning from each other, and that's part of what we're doing tonight. Uh, there are farmers, exceptionally good farmers here in Wales, who, you know, are, I'm sure, with the best in the world for what they do. We can all learn from each other. You know, we're not different to any other sector. There's always something new to learn. Uh, the day I think that we think we know everything there is to know, then um, that's a very dangerous place to be. Um, you know, my work in Bangor every day, I've got to learn something every day. The day I stop learning, um, I'm sure I um, I deserve the sack. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's always room to learn. There are always developments, so we always need to move forward. If we stay in the same place, in all reality, we're going backwards. And there are other countries uh, who are becoming very competitive and are pushing forwards. And then fifth, how do we improve? And, and then, you know, how to um, do better, always striving. This evening though, we're gonna look at these first two in more detail than the other three, but we might touch on maybe four and five later on as well. Uh, but where we're at and where there are opportunities for change. I just want to share uh, one screen here, which explains a little bit about those greenhouse gases or the most important greenhouse gases that relate to agricultural systems. These three are the ones that we discuss most. We've all heard about carbon dioxide. Uh, every one of us, we've all heard about methane, I'm sure. And I'm sure that many of us have heard about nitrous oxide. Well, you'll see in the table on the um, left-hand column there, sorry, the right-hand column, methane and nitrous oxide are 25 times and 298 times stronger than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. There's been a lot of discussion about the real effect of methane because it breaks down after about 15 years and so on. But at this moment, these are the figures we work to worldwide. So, you know, one molecule, if you like, of methane released is the same as releasing 25 molecules of carbon dioxide. And one molecule of nitrous oxide is the same as releasing 298 molecules of carbon dioxide. And in terms of agricultural systems, well, we'll see later on. It's these last two that are the most important um, in terms of beef and sheep, livestock, agriculture. Livestock agriculture doesn't release a huge amount of carbon dioxide, but it does release other greenhouse gases. So remember these three, please. Uh, three greenhouse gases of different strengths, and these are certainly the three most important. Where do they come from? Well, um, carbon dioxide um, primarily comes from burning fuel. So when we burn diesel in our vehicles, when we uh, create fertilizer in factories, uh, also when we add lime, a certain amount of carbon is released at that point. But to all extents and purposes, it's when we burn fossil fuels, that's where carbon dioxide comes from. Methane, I'm sure we all know this, comes from ruminants. Um, it's produced when grass is broken down in the digestive system. 
the bacteria in that digestive system release methane. And then the last one, nitrogen oxide, sorry, nitrous oxide, comes when we fertilize the land and also when animals excrete on the land. So we know that there's some amount of the nitrogen that's um, deposited, be that as fertilizer or slurry or manure, some amount of the nitrogen that goes into the ground is also released as nitrous oxide, again, by bacteria. So bacteria are the problem, uh, bacteria in the digestive system um, of animals release methane and then bacteria in soil release nitrous oxide. Yeah? So the first point is to account for it. If we want to know where we're at, we have to measure the carbon footprint. Something that we've all heard about, I'm sure. Yeah. So what is that? There's so much discussion of it. What does it mean? And then especially what does it mean in the context of a farm, in an agricultural context? So let's say, you know, the farm, that box in the middle on farm production, let's say that that's your farm there, right? And it's a sheep farm. Um, you could put a dairy cow in there if you wanted, or you could put uh, some pigs in. But for tonight's example, we'll consider that farm being a sheep farm. On that sheep farm, well, the box on the left, we've got inputs. Yeah, so the sheep, uh, maybe at this time of year, just before lambing, uh, they get some amount of uh, concentrated feed. I'm sure we also put a bit of um, fertilizer on the land to grow grass or other crops. Um, we may inject, uh, oh, sorry, we may um, be spraying um, uh, weeds. We burn some fuel as well. Um, we are also getting bedding in place for the animals to um, be shedded and we're getting purchase stock in as well as using electricity and other power. So as well as using these, um, they either release carbon dioxide, um, for example, the fact that we burn fuel or that we use electricity, uh, they uh, release methane. Uh, those are the ones in the middle there, CH4. Uh, those are the sheep that we buy in. Um, and we also release this nitrous oxide because we're fertilizing the land. So we can look at any farm now and we can ask well how much fertilizer do you use how much concentrated feed do you use and so on and we can account quite accurately how many of those greenhouse gases how much of those greenhouse gases is released as a result of these inputs okay so the inputs are sorted now we will look at the farm itself in the middle and we'll count how many sheep there are there. And let's say there's 100 sheep on the farm. And we can estimate, well, the sheep uh, are of this size. Let's say that they're 70 kilos. Uh, those sheep will produce about so much methane. OK, so for every 100 sheep, we can account, again, relatively accurately how much methane is produced. Those sheep also excrete. OK, they uh, they make manure, uh, they make urine, and we can account for how much nitrous oxide is released as a result of that. We also then look at the outputs, which is on the right hand side here. We account how many lambs are produced, uh, how much they weigh, how many sheep are sold. We look at wool and so on and so on. So we know how many kilos or tons of outputs the farm creates. For all extents and purposes then, what we do is we divide the right-hand side of the screen with the left-hand side, right? So how many of those different greenhouse gases are produced or released for every kilo of lamb or beef or a litre of milk or a dozen eggs, whatever our farm is, okay? So calculate the inputs, how many um, greenhouse gases are linked with those inputs, then look at the outputs and divide one with the other. Also, if you see this uh, little uh, tree on the left-hand side here, we know that farms also absorb carbon. 
they're a carbon sink. Um, farms release carbon and other greenhouse gases like methane, like nitrous oxide, but also we've got trees on farms, we've got soils on farms, and these draw carbon in. And we can estimate, yeah? Um, and will be sucked in again. And then what we can do is we can subtract the total uh, from the outputs of greenhouse gases with what's stored in trees and so on. So we can account for how many farms are on the, how many trees are on the farm, how many hectares of different sorts of soil uh, are on the farm and so on. Then at the end, as I said, uh, we take one away from the other and we can then account for how many kilos of carbon dioxide are produced for every kilo of lamb in this example, or if you like, uh, for each hectare of farmed land. Okay, so that in essence is what we do when we measure a farm's carbon footprint. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. There's a lot of different tools that we can use uh, to help with this process. And some of them are more accurate than others, yeah? And some of them, uh, going back, some of them ignore some of these issues and some of them include all these. Uh, so uh, there are these different tools that can then give different results. Uh, some measure more than carbon, some, well, actually most I'd say, ignore how much carbon is stored in trees, in soils and so on, because, well, it's quite difficult to account for that correctly. Uh, and there's a lot of tools that just say, we're not gonna try. Um, we can calculate the output, uh, but we're just not gonna try and calculate what's sucked in um, and, and is sequestered or stored. As a result of that, um, be very careful when you compare results of carbon footprints using different tools to calculate those results, because the methodology just isn't the same. If one includes something and another one doesn't, well, it just doesn't make sense to make that comparison directly between one and the other. If we want to compare, we want to use the same tool. And that's exactly what we've done in this work. So, um, you know, farmers very often say, well, actually not farmers, um, you know, which one of these is best? There's a lot of them available, which one's best? Uh, actually, it depends on what you want from it. Some are more accurate than others, but there's a lot more work, yeah? If you want a sort of vague idea, there are some tools that will give you a, a general idea, but yeah, they may not be as accurate. So it just depends entirely what you want. Um, so yeah, we worked with 20 farms across Wales, um, uh, upland farms, lowland farms, mountain farms, um, relatively large farms, um, you know, average size farms, uh, different breeds, different systems, um, some with stuck like cows, some buying stores in. Most of them a mix of beef and sheep, yeah, uh, one or two farms uh, were just sheep farms or one or two were just beef farms and we used what they call an economic allocation. And what that is, is um, it's, it's how we calculate the, um, uh, the greenhouse gas outputs that go to the beef side and how much goes to the sheep side. I'll give you an example here. So let's say we come to calculate uh, your farm's carbon footprint and you say, well, 60% uh, of the farm's income comes from the beef sector. What we then do is um, that 60% of the emissions for, for example, fertilizer automatically go to the beef side of the business. Because, you know, I'm sure you put fertilizer on the land, you know, and there are sheep and cows grazing that land. So we have to have a way of trying to differentiate and allocate. And that's how we do that. Um, we go according to the farm's economic size according to each venture and that's how we also calculate the sequestration let's say that your farm um, absorbs 10 tons of carbon yeah but 60% uh, of your income comes from cattle well then I give six tons so 60% of the total 
to the cattle and four tons to sheep. So we used Bangor's tool here uh, in Bangor University. We've been doing this for years. We've developed a tool, our own tool. It's a tool that uses um, the latest data. Uh, it's a method that's recognized uh, internationally um, and is a very detailed research tool um, that we're very confident um, is with the most accurate we can get. So, you know, we've, we've got confidence in the work that we've done. Um, and we've done um, similar work on, on tens of farms over many years, and we've published the work in international journals for peer review. Um, so we have worked with 20 farms. We've looked at their inputs over a period of 12 months or more. Um, if there was more available, it was even better because we could work out an average. And um, you know, that's really what we've done in this, is what we said in the, the slide before. What are your inputs? What are your outputs? How many trees have you got? What are your hedges? What's the soil type? So on. And then we've worked out the difference, yeah, between the emissions and what's stored. Um, so that then creates the net emissions. Um, so what were the results? I, try, I was trying to think of the uh, simplest way of uh, giving a lot of information in one place. And I hope I've done that uh, in a way that I can explain relatively easily. So here you, across the bottom there, you can see the different farms, the different sectors, um, hill, lamb, upland, upland farms, lowland farms. Um, and these are the average emissions of greenhouse gases. That's that GHG there for each kilo of live weight. Uh, beef on the left hand side, the three bars, and then lamb, uh, the, the, the three on the, sorry, beef right hand side, lamb left hand side, um, across those 20 farms. And we can see, well, uh, the emissions are broadly similar in reality. Some bars are a little higher than others. Um, but there isn't really a huge difference between these different farms. Uh, the emissions on the lowland systems in terms of the beef sector were a little higher. And in terms of emissions from the um, mountain or hill um, sector, that was the lowest in terms of land. And that was quite interesting. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But if we just take the 11 hill farms, so these here are, are an average. Uh, but if we include data for every one of these uh, individually, those 11 farms, then this in a way is slightly more interesting because we can see uh, there's one or two of these farms whose emissions are exceptionally low for every kilo of lamb produced. They're really, really low you know, five, five and a half, yeah? On the right-hand side then, there are some farms that are quite a bit higher, not far off double the lowest, and then most somewhere in the middle. So we've got quite a substantial range over the same sorts of farms, remember, these are all hill farms. So this is more interesting to me to think, well, what are some farms doing that means their emissions are very low and what are other farms doing that means their emissions are higher? So I've put these emissions in a pie graph here, and I'm not going to agree, uh, going to explain all of these different colors. I'm just going to concentrate on a few of them. One of them is very, very obvious. That What is it? Orange color um, in the pie chart. And if your eyes are good enough, you'll see what these are. And these are the methane emissions from animals. So um, in every case, this uh, it was the, the methane emissions from animals that were responsible for uh, the largest percentage of the, the total emissions from a very, very long way. 
in every system, be it uh, Hill on the, the left, uh, Lowland on the right, um, with Upland in the middle there. So methane is important, yeah? These methane emissions really are something we can't avoid. You'll see in grey, and brown as well, actually, that the grey and brown there, those are the second categories. Uh, and these are nitrous oxide. And where does the nitrous oxide come from? Well, fertilizer. And also, you remember when the animals uh, excrete, yeah, be it um, urine or manure, some amount of the nitrogen is lost again. Um, and remember, it's 298 times stronger than carbon dioxide, and that's the grey and brown, nitrous oxide. So if we look at one or two other factors, um, yeah, electricity, for example, um, it was so low, it, it appears as nothing on our graph because th there wasn't a, a figure for it. Concentrates is green, concentrated feed, and that's 6% in some cases. Um, Lowland farms uh, put more fertilizer down. Um, the farm on the right hand side there. Downland farmers use more fertilizer. So the blue uh, on the, the, the top right, that was bigger on the lowland farms. Um, so when we talk about seriously reducing farms' carbon footprint, uh, we can concentrate on three or four factors that will make a substantial difference saving electricity and so on. Of course, we need to do it. You know, we need to do everything we can, but making electricity savings in reality won't make almost any difference because um, the emissions that come from electricity use are so, so low. So it's methane and nitrous oxide that are the most important elements. And if we look at beef, um, the pattern is almost exactly the same. But what we see here in general now is that there are more emissions from the use of concentrated feed. So if you look at the graph on the left there, you'll see concentrates 12%, that light green uh, at about two o'clock on the graph. We, for example, saw um, that upland farms, oh, sorry, hill farms, sometimes fed more of their animals, maybe because winters are longer, you know, um, they keep animals indoors for longer and they're feeding for longer. Uh, so, again, this orange is very, very obvious. So, to try and condense all that into one uh, graph, uh, methane is the most important every single time and is responsible for around half all the emissions uh, from these farms. So reducing that has to be a priority. Uh, then nitrous oxide, I've already discussed that. Um, the use of fertilizer very often wasn't all that high because a lot of the systems we have here in Wales are systems that aren't particularly intensive. So inputs really aren't that high. Um, which is why then the nitrous oxide emissions were lower uh, by comparison. I've talked about the general use of um, concentrates that tended to be higher in beef systems. We'd expect to see that, um, you know, uh, fuel electricity use very, very low. Quite interestingly, uh, it's interesting, to, it's important to say as well, there were some patterns uh, that became more obvious depending on the type of farm, uh, you know, being hill or lowland, I, I used that example of the use of concentrates between the two of them being higher on hill land for beef because of longer winters, that example. But generally, there weren't any big, big differences between farms depending on the systems they had. There were one or two examples that I've referred to, but, but on the whole. Um, and also, um, the size of farm made almost no difference at all. Well, actually, it, it did make no difference at all. So this isn't just, you know, something, oh, well, it's fine for these big farmers. They can make a difference. No, no, not at all. Um, the size of the farm for every kilo of produce, uh, the size of the farm made no difference. Um, and and I've, I've seen that before. Um, the last point here, 
it's definite that some of these farms are very efficient and they're out, their emissions are very, very low, and that's excellent news. Then we come to this element of sequestration, carbon storage. Um, what we see, um, so, you know, we've talked about how much carbon's released. Um, we've talked about the emissions, well, not just carbon, but the other greenhouse gases. And now we're talking about what's stored. And we can see soil is the dark green. That was the most important from a very long way. Um, we've got grass-based systems in Wales, obviously. Um, you know, generally that's what we had on these 22 farms. One or two of these farms grew some crops, but most of the land was under pasture, uh, and that tended to be permanent pasture, which can absorb carbon. Uh, trees then on the um, right-hand side here, the, the blue section, um, trees are quite important. Um, and you know, the same is true uh, for lamb. Again, uh, we've just looked at beef as well there. So one or two things uh, to say here are that soils were by a very long margin, uh, the most important element. And we have to remember that when we try to calculate how much carbon stored, it is an estimate. It depends on a lot of different factors. So without us coming to your farm and measuring how much carbon stored and then coming back in five years and seeing if that's gone up or down, um, at best, we can make an estimate. And it's exceptionally important to remember that. Also, after a certain point, we really can't carry on and carry on and carry on increasing how much carbon stored in soil. After a certain point, there really isn't a great deal more that we can store. It can sit there and be an important store of carbon, but it won't carry on growing. The table here um, shows we, we saw very few trees on these farms. Apart from one farm, there's one farm that planted uh, a substantial section of their land as woodland. And without doubt, in a few years again, once those trees really start properly growing, because they were quite young at, at this point, it'll be a huge help for that farm um, to, to undo their emissions, to reduce their net emissions. So that, I think, was something quite exciting for that farm and something uh, that others maybe should emulate. But generally, uh, the uh, woodland cover on these farms was very low. And that might well be expected in some of them, you know, uh, mountain hill farms and so on. But uh, we all know the importance and the discussion uh, related to planting trees. And this work certainly shown that there's some way to go um, on most of these farms anyway. But again, you know, how much uh, carbon drawn in is, is is very dependent on how those trees are managed. If you want to efficiently store carbon, you have to manage your woodlands. Um, so I'm getting to an end now. How do we get to net zero? Are we there yet? Um, you know, we've said um, Wales's agricultural sector needs to be net zero. Are we there? Um, no, is the answer in terms of these 20 farms. There wasn't, there wasn't a farm that stored as much carbon as they emitted. So if we look at the mean, that column in the middle there, the average, um, according to our figures, anyway, these farms stored between 10% of their emissions up to some 27%. So um, quite a long way from being net zero. But there was one farm, the hill farm, it was, a, it was a beef and sheep farm, and they were quite close to being net zero. They were quite close. And that, you know, um, th there were very few changes that they needed to make, and I'm sure that they would get there very quickly then. So how are we going to get to this net zero? Uh, Welsh Government wants us to do it. Uh, the English government wants us to do it. You know, net zero is 
where the sector releases and stores the same amount of carbon and at the moment it looks like we're emitting quite a lot more than we're storing so how do we get to net zero um, it's not just government that wants us to do it but you know the nfu for example has a very very obvious very clear intention of doing this 10 years sooner than welsh government wants us to do it um, and of course we've talked about uh, the welsh way already it's not just something that government wants us to do it's something that we as an industry have stated that we want to do so how do we get there two things we can reduce our emissions in the first place and secondly we can increase how much we store it's as simple as that you have to do both so what will work on one farm won't necessarily work on another uh, that's entirely entirely obvious but every farm can do something to move towards this point. So the first is to reduce uh, you know, emissions in the first place uh, by reducing inputs um, and using them efficiently. So less animals that do nothing on your farms, you know, um, you know they, they produce methane and they don't give you anything back. Um, there might be a health issue. Um, there might be room to improve genetics. Um, there might be space to um, improve grassland management. There's no point growing grass to then waste it. Um, you know, if we put fertilizer on the land and half the grass goes to waste, well, in reality, half the fertilizer goes to waste. Uh, improving diet, that sort of stuff. It's a, it's a very long list, and obviously, we're not going to discuss every one of them uh, because I know uh, Joe and Louise are going to discuss a few more of them uh, later on. So we could have a whole evening on every one of these individually. Um, what, of course, we need to remember is that these in almost every case make economic make business sense so why not do them uh the second thing then um you know how do we increase what we store um animals will produce methane we're not going to be able to avoid that um so it's essential then for farms you know there will be emissions from farms but we can store them in other ways uh, in our soils, if we manage our soils in a uh, way that um, enables us to store more carbon. Uh, planting more trees in the right places can certainly bring benefits to the business and can certainly bring carbon benefits. Uh, there's more and more focus on this. There are more grants available. You know. All I'm going to say there is the right tree in the right place can certainly be uh, of benefit to the business and the environment. Um, and even things like, you know, the bottom right picture there, letting our hedges grow a bit wider and a bit higher. How many hedges do I see that are cut almost to the point where, you know, they just can't be cut anymore? Things like that are going to make a difference. Uh, there's no point planting a hedge just to then cut it back to the root every year. Um, so we've been here. Where are we going next? Well, four and five in reality, share good practice. Uh, Joe and Louise are going to talk about the work that they've been doing in a moment and trying to do better, always striving to do better. Uh, I don't think uh, this discussion is going to disappear particularly quickly. The pressure on the sector is going to continue. Customers are going to expect that. Government's going to expect that. We, as an industry, are telling the world, you know, um, buy sheep and beef from Wales because it is produced sustainably. Well, we need to do that. Um, and I think there are a lot of benefits to the industry um, from doing it. So thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, the, the four that I've been working with, Non and Dave, uh, Non especially um, from Bangor University, um, and Colm and Dave Stiles from the University of Limerick. Um, it was a team effort. I'm just here as one person, but it's definitely a team effort. And I'd like to thank those for certain thanks for the 20 farms that, that took place. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without you. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you to Habiki Khamri for the funding and to you joining us tonight for showing your interest in the work. So uh, with those few words, um, you can hear from two of Bangor's PhD students. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor. I thought that was exceptionally interesting. Um, so if we move on now then to Louise, uh, if that's all right, Louise. Just share my screen. Is that okay? Can everyone see that? Yeah. So, um, like Mia and Professor said, I am Louise. I'm a PhD student at Bangor University, uh, and the title of my PhD is Strategies to Reach Zero Carbon Beef and Sheep Production on Welsh Farms. Uh, so, I come from a hill farm uh, on the west coast of Scotland myself. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree in veterinary sciences at the University of Glasgow. Uh, and what really drew me to this area of research was, as I was going through university, seeing all the negative media coverage uh, around agriculture uh, and red meat in particular. Um, and on top of that, at home, uh, a lot of farms in my area were being sold for forestry. Um, I think in our town alone, there's about 1,500 hectares uh, being planted. Uh, and I felt like there had to be another way to achieve these environmental targets but still being able to farm. So Professor's talked a little bit about it already. Carbon neutrality is a huge topic, uh, but to start with, we need to know where are Welsh farms currently, um, which is a lot of this carbon footprint and work you've heard about. Uh, you know, what level of emissions are we looking at? How close are we to achieving net zero? Uh, and what do we need to do to get there in terms of reducing emissions, um, as well as what barriers are in our way? Uh, and the way we do this is through carbon footprinting um, and modelling of mitigation scenarios. So similar to the way these farms have been carbon audited, we use calculators like AgriCalc and the Cool Farm tool, uh, and we need data on the land, on the animals and the energy use of the farm. And then we can really just play around with these figures to see how far we can reduce emissions before we look at uh, offsetting the remaining. So then once we have these net zero scenarios, looking at factors affecting the uptake of mitigation uh, measures, uh, and obviously a big one at this time would be policy, especially at a time where there's a movement away from uh, the current subsidies towards new approaches such as payment for public goods or payment for ecosystem services, um, as well as looking at uh, any other barriers to implementation, uh, like are these options practical? Uh, and are they econ economically viable? So I'll just sk uh, skip through this slide quite quickly. When I talk about mitigation options, these are the kind of things I'm talking about. So in terms of reducing emissions, we're looking at optimising nutrition, uh, you know, reducing the need for concentrates by improving grassland and grazing management, uh, which Joel talks to you a bit more uh, about in detail later. Uh, that alongside breeding and genetics, improving health status, um, as well as manure management and better fertilizer use. Um, they all really just tie in with increasing production efficiency, having less inputs, uh, needing less land for the same amount of uh, level of production. Uh, so there is more land available for sequestration. Uh, and the kind of key strategy for that would be through agroforestry um, and having the right tree in the right place. Uh, so at the moment, I've been comparing uh, modelling tools. Uh, in particular, I've been looking at SRUC's AgriCalc, um, as well as Banger's own carbon footprinting tool. Uh, and I've been comparing them in terms of results for the same farms, uh, then comparing them in terms of methodology and emission factors. You know, what's causing these different, uh, like quite, there's quite a few big differences um, in the results. And basically just seeing what works well uh, where in these models and seeing what would work best for this project. Uh, and then moving on from there, I'm in the process of exploring net zero scenarios from uh, these farms we already have the data for. So running combinations of four or five mitigation options uh, with original farm data to see which are most effective um, and then looking at the area of sequestration needed for those remaining emissions. So going forward, my project will be really based on the technical side of the research, focusing on improving these models, making them more accurate. You know, they don't include everything, even the kind of standard, um, you know, internationally accepted, don't include um, all sequestration or all emissions. Um, and I'm also really keen to look at how we express these carbon footprints, uh, looking into different functional units and metrics. 
Um, so Professor mentioned it earlier that the kind of standard way to express carbon footprint for uh, in the red meat sector would be per kilogram per kilogram of live weight. Um, but there are these new um, kind of novel ways of expressing them, uh, for example, per kilogram of protein, uh, which, as you can imagine, when looking at things like diet choice, can make a huge difference. Uh, and then moving on from the farm level, looking at national level modelling in the agriculture and forestry sector, uh, so purely looking at land use and its balance, seeing what area of land we have available, um, seeing what number of animals and their productivity versus the area of forestry to see you know, what meeting these net zero targets could look like uh, in Wales. And then finally, the kind of last aspect of my project would be the social side. Um, and we're hoping to present these net zero scenarios to farmers and seeing you know, what would work and what wouldn't work for them, what mitigation options are you know, most appealing and how could we encourage, uh, encourage farmers to take up uh, other mitigation options. Uh, and I think this side of it's really important. Um, you know, it's great to know that this is all achievable on paper, but um, if these mitigation options aren't going to be implemented, uh, then we're never really going to meet those net zero targets. So I hope I haven't run through that too quickly, but um, I hope that has given you a bit of an overview of my project and the kind of research uh, we're putting into carbon neutrality in agriculture. I think it is a really exciting topic and there's a lot of work going into it right now. So um, just Thank you to HCC for the opportunity to talk tonight and thank you all for your time. Pass over to Joe to tell you about more about his project. Thank you, Louisa. If you got a Joe. Yeah. yeah, I'll uh, just get my chat screen up. Okay, that should be up. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'll take it away. So as Nia said earlier, um, I'm Irish, um, but I wanted to kind of experience agriculture in other countries and, you know, learn a lot from that. So that's one of the reasons why I, why I wanted to come to Wales and, uh, and undertake this work. So as you can see there, the title of my project and my PhD thesis is Determining the Potential for Precision Grazing to Improve the Resilience of Livestock Production Systems. Well, it, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but basically I'll be looking at and grazing systems, different grazing systems, um, and looking at the kind of the environmental and economic uh, inputs in these and also the outputs, and basically evaluating them based on these. So I thought I'd start off with a little bit about myself, um, who I am. Well, as Nia said, I'm a University College Dublin graduate. I'm a Bangor PhD student at the moment. I graduated um, in 2018 with a major in animal science. Um, and after this, I undertook some research work with the University College Dublin, working under Professor Tommy Boland, um, mainly in the area of multi-species, but covered um, sheep production systems, sheep nutrition, beef systems. Um, and I also undertook some work with Devonish Nutrition as well. Uh, and during that period, it kind of gave me a great insight into the research world and further heightened my resolve to undertake research um, and to pursue that as a career. So that's kind of my academic background, but but I feel most importantly, I'm a farmer, um, as is Prisor, uh, uh, as is Louise. And I think being farmers, we understand the kind of the joys of farming, the difficulties of farming. And I think that is really important for academics and for researchers. Um, and that's kind of one of my main drivers is that I know how much farming means to people. I know it's much more than just a job, like it, it's a lifestyle. Um, and I can certainly say I wouldn't be the person I am today without, without agriculture. So I want to be part of the people working to ensure that agriculture is, is there and part of culture into the future. And that other people have the opportunities that I have um, to experience farming and to undertake it. But that's a bit about me. Well, why is this topic important? Why is grassland management matter? Well, Louise said earlier, and Priso said as well, it's, it's one of the mitigation strategies and one of the ways to reduce our, our CO2 emissions and our methane emissions and overall our carbon footprint. Wales is ideally suited to growing grass. Um, as Prisor said earlier, Ireland are a big, you know, uh, exponent of, of talking about that and pushing that message. And I feel Wales is on a similar level. 
and Wales needs to push that message and focus on grass production. Um, but currently, the potential isn't being reached, you know. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. But grazing management plays plays a massive role in that and maximising yield um, and utilisation. If we can do that, we can reduce our costs. We can make sure we're making the most out of fertiliser. We'll reduce concentrate inputs, which is going to bring down our emissions as well. Um, and some research says that that for extra if per extra ton of um you extra grass utilized you can uh, make an extra hundred euros uh profit per hectare um so like a grass system is both environmentally sustainable and econ economically sustainable and therefore it's important why we understand why yields currently aren't aren't reaching their potential um so with that in mind you know we're, we're undertaking some baseline work i think kind of a a thread that's run through all our presentations has been that we need to have the baseline. We need to understand currently where we are before we make changes. Um, so basically I'm conducting some survey work, which will examine grazing practices. We'll try and get as high an input from farmers as we can and get farmers' opinions, farmers' ideas on why they're undertaking certain systems and why maybe they haven't adapted to more intensive systems um, and uh, some higher input systems. Um, and overall, I think it's a really good opportunity for farmers to give their input because I feel a lot of the time in research, is, it's very one way, you know, it's researchers and academics telling farmers what to do. Well, clearly the message or what we've been saying hasn't been coming across right or hasn't been implemented by farmers. So maybe there's something we need to pick up on and there's a better way of selling that message. So that's what I feel part of this work is. Um, and obviously, this will be distributed via social media and other means and other channels. So once we have that baseline, we're going to um, conduct some experimental search research. So we're going to look at set stocking versus cell grazing. Now, these are two very dis different systems. And as Professor kind of said, you know, it's a bit of horses for courses. Some systems suit other farmers, suit farmers better. They work better in other areas. So that's kind of where, where we're looking at, you know, looking at one system that's very high input, uh, labor intensive, and one that that's not. Um, and we're going to try and look at the kind of the economic impact, the environmental impact, um, and do a detailed analysis. And we'll be able to look at these systems as a whole and further understand, you know, which one's beneficial for environmental, e economic, and maybe there's uh, certain things that offset each other. Um, so that's kind of what the future holds. And look, I've kind of, you know, that's that's a brief look at, at kind of the work I have planned. Um, I'll finish up with, with thanking HCC for this opportunity. And I look forward to talking more about my work when we have more time and more detail to talk about. Um, and I thank all of you for, for tuning in and listening to some of the exciting research that's ongoing and some of the research that's going on over the next few years. And I'll finish with a bit of a plug that hopefully the survey will be out in the next few months. So keep an eye out for that um, because, you know, we're trying to get farmers' opinions and that'll be your chance to give views back to us. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Dach, Joe. Um... Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, again, uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, I am a little bit worried about the time because I don't want to keep everyone, especially if you haven't had supper tonight. Um, so if we go to some of the questions, um, if we don't ask your question, we will answer the question once the webinar is finished. So don't worry. Asking what barriers do you think there will be um, with the uptake of GHD reducing practices on farms? Yeah, I think there's probably, there's a lot of barriers. Um, I think probably one of the key ones I would say from experience is, you know, farmers are used to their own practices and it works for them so far. So why would they change? So I think it's important to prove these things, um, you know, that if, they, if you use these mitigation measures, you know, your produce will have um, the added benefit of being, you know, a reduced carbon footprint. Um, and a lot of other ones, really, a lot of them can be quite expensive. Um, and a lot of them maybe aren't so applicable to hill farms and things like that. Um, 
you know, a lot of people, uh, you could argue that, if, you know, if you want to reduce your fertilizer, a lot of people, would, a lot of farms would need that. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot um, to unpack with that one, I would think. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Joe, do you do you see any challenges, um, especially with the aspect you're coming from with the, the the grazing and the uptake of more of a rotational grazing system? Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of kind of things to think about. Um, I suppose cost is a massive one um, for farmers. You know, to set up a rotational system, it's it's going to cost uh, a good amount in initial investment. Um, I think there's also kind of concerns around, you know, the management of them. Um, uh, certainly systems like the cell grazing or the precision grazing systems that we'll be looking at are very kind of high intensive uh, systems and a, a lot of labor input to them. Um, so they're kind of, there's some of the barriers, but there's other barriers out there. And that's part of the research work is that we want to get kind of farmers uh, views on what the barriers are, because, you know, we can think of some um, and I've named some of them there, but there's going to be more and there's going to be more that farmers can come up with. And possibly there's things that, you know, we're not, we're not thinking um, and that'll come up when, when, in our survey work. So that's a big kind of driver of why we're undertaking that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's, a couple of, well, there's quite a few questions. So I'm just going to try and pick the most, um, most kind of similar questions that come through. One for Prasar, um, does the boating lamb emissions for low ground unit get transferred into methane if the farmer decides to keep their own replacements? You know, are they inter interchangeable? Yep, good, good question. Uh, and yes, <clears throat> we do take into account the uh, number of lambs that would be sold or retained as because they're obviously outputs of the farm or of the production system, even if they are retained or taken back within the flock, but yet yeah, they would most definitely be counted. Yeah. Um, and then could you explain further what management um, would affect woodland sequestration and how does it, you know, its age affect this as well? Yeah, well, you know, unfortunately, we've got a lot of poorly managed woodland uh, in, in Wales. Um, I mean, I've heard quite a lot of, well, I've heard quite a few people say that we need to, you know, put as much emphasis on better managing what we have, as well as, you know, um, increasing the amounts that we have. So we probably need to do both. I mean, it's, you know, all very well and good saying, right, we need to plant X thousand hectares of of, of woodland but if they're not managed well then they fail and you know nothing really benefits from that not in terms of carbon or uh, for sure so um yeah manage i'm not a forester but you know the woodlands need woodlands need managing is you know, the, the planting is in some ways the, the simple um stage it's the management afterwards that will ultimately give you good yield of, of trees or timber and ultimately of course that will mean that they're sequestering more carbon so well-managed woodland will be sequestering much more carbon than a badly or unmanaged woodland yeah that's, that's great um so another um question was how are the carbon calculations done for imported livestock feed uh, okay, good question. So we do look at um, what we call the upstream emissions. So, uh, yep, manufacturing fertilizer, you know, it takes a lot of energy to, to produce fertilizer, importing feed, concentrate feed. Uh, there's obviously, there has been, there have been emissions, but they might have happened the other side of the world. So the, the tool does take those impacts into account. Um, I mean, there's a there's a database that we turn to that will give us standard values for, um, and in effect, most tools should use the same um, values so that we do have, you know, some um, parity in the approach. But yeah, we most definitely would look at upstream emissions. It's a really good question. Otherwise, you know, we could be missing out uh, really important impacts that are happening elsewhere off farm. But ultimately, they're happening because of the farm, yeah, if the, if the concentrate is required on the farm. 
Yeah, Jack. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Louise. Um, you mentioned about you know using the measure of um, per kilogram of protein. Um, there's been quite a bit of interest in quite a few questions. Um, is there any countries currently using that um, that measure? And you know, are there any examples of different food groups that are using that measure at all? Anything you read? Uh, I don't think there's really anyone using it as a kind of standard at the moment. Um, a lot of the research into it is relatively new and it is just in terms of comparing, you know, different meat, dairy against vegetables and things like that. But um, no, a professor might know a bit better than me, but I haven't um, read anything about anyone actually using it yet. Did you have anything to add? Uh, what was the first part of the question, yeah? Sorry, I was um, looking at the chat. Any countries were currently using a measure of per kilogram protein? Uh, well, it seems more in the dairy sector, actually. Um, it is used more for dairy sector because it's, it's often a better comparison than per litre of milk. If it's, you know, uh, if that milk is being used for cheese, for instance, where it's actually the solids that we're most uh, interested in. Um, so uh, I think, you know, Louise made a really good point about, you know, how we actually measure impact. And um, if we think about protein, not all protein is the same. You've got better quality protein and lower quality protein. And obviously we do know as well that meat can provide a lot of other minerals and nutrients and so on. So um, we need to be ensure, or well, we need to ensure in the future that we're a bit cleverer in terms of how we measure impacts because uh, um, just like for like sort of a kilo of one product versus a kilo of another product tells us often only a fraction of the story if, the, if those products are very different. Yeah, definitely. It's an interesting point that you um, that you raised there, Louise. Um, a question for Joe here. Um, Joe, what kind of field trials are you hoping to do to prove the benefits of uh, precision grazing? Yeah, well, we're hoping to undertake grazing trials. So we have a number of different sites um, that I picked out. Um, and basically we'll run a, a set stocking system and we'll then run a, a kind of a cell grazing type system as well. We'll collect data from that. So on animal performance, grass production, grass utilization, yield, um, and we'll look at some environmental um, greenhouse gas emissions and some other kind of environmental factors as well. I know kind of soil compaction might be part of the work as well. As that's a concern with kind of cell grazing and running a large amount of livestock and kind of a, a smaller area. Um, and then once we kind of have all that data, we be able to put it into kind of a modeling system, um, which we have in Bangor University. Um, and we'll be able to kind of analyze that and look at systems uh, comparison. And then we'll possibly we might also look at that kind of scaling that up to kind of a wealth level um, in total and see what, what impacts that might have on kind of the total greenhouse gas emissions. You know, if, obviously, as I said, it's, it's different horses for courses because kind of the land type is very varied in Wales. But, you know, if we all switch to one type of system, what impact would that have? So that's kind of the hopefully that answers answers the question yeah that's great thanks joe um so i am conscious of time and um, if we there's an interesting question from here um for you prasar is your footprint affected if you make better if you were to make better use of the car a carcass so um use as much of the animal as possible hides liver food fat soups etc absolutely uh, most definitely yeah, the less waste the better um it's you know, it's ultimately, of course, all about inputs for outputs. Yeah, so the the more, you know, if we can increase the amount of, of usable product um, that we have and, and maintain inputs the same, then obviously per kilo of outputs, the, the impacts will be reduced. So, yeah, I mean, that applies to, you know, having livestock growing well, growing quicker. So they're spending less days on farm, they're reaching their target weights, maybe a month earlier so than, than usual so they're producing a month's less methane um, and then they're giving a good yield of of, of meat or usable product um, at the end so most definitely and, and you know I was having a discussion with students today about wool 
and the fact that we're not using wool much these days, we've replaced it with plastics, polyesters and so on for clothes. And, and it's just, um, you know, the, the more products that we can get from um, our animals, then the better for the, in terms of carbon as well, because otherwise we just replace those products with other things. Yeah. Um, last few questions. Um, how, in, well, regarding fertilizer, how much difference is there regarding emissions between organic, i.e., homegrown uh, manure fertilizer compared to purchased fertilizer? Um, and is it realistically possible or rec recommended to get away from artificial fertilizer? Uh, yeah, good, good question. Um, the, I mean, it's not. You know the, the sort of comparison between organic and in and conventional systems um often per kilogram of product um organic systems might come out um less favorably actually because the outputs are less yeah there's less kilos produced um but maybe per hectare because the inputs are often lower per hectare organic systems can um, appear better. So it does depend on what, you know, sort of how we look at the data and so on. Um, so to answer the question, um, making the best use of organic resources, absolute no brainer, because if we can reduce the amount of inorganic fertilizer we need by making better use of home produced, if you like, organic slurries and manures and so on, then absolutely we need to do that. Um, and if we, you know, from an econ economic perspective as well, fertilizers obviously often the the one of the biggest costs on farms. So, reducing their use as much as possible through better use of organic resources is, is you know, it has got to be a, a very important going forward. Yeah, and I presume, Louise, that's going to be an element of the work of your work and um, that you'll be looking into um, in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, reducing, yeah, obviously, if you're reducing your fertil, your you know, um, imported fertilizers. Yeah. Um, in comparison to utilizing what you've got is definitely. Yeah. So one last question um, that has come through for you, Joe. Um, are you considering using multi-species um, swords? Um, well, as part of this work, no. Um, but there, there's a there's a large amount of work in Ireland at the moment being done. So the Smart Sword project is a Heartland project. Um, there's another project in UCD that are kind of looking at uh, multi-species swords for cattle production. One's based on purely cattle production. There's one on sheep, and there's one based on um, a mixed grazing systems as well. Um, and kind of my opinion, yeah, like that that so that work will kind of cover your multi-species. Um, you know research and then then kind of my opinion you know a large i don't think there's going to be a big switch to pure multi-species i know even in new zealand where they're kind of big advocates of it, it there's it's always just a percentage of farm and um, so i think grass is still going to be our main feed stuff um going forward with multi-species added in and um, so i think that's kind of where we're aiming with this project but there's definitely work ongoing out there so um look into the smart sword project or the heartland project if you're interested in multi-species swords because they should be coming out with with some good results over the next while that's great and um, thanks joe and um yeah diolch yn fawr i gyd o'r ein siaradwyr heno um thank you very much to all our speakers tonight it's been exceptionally interesting and uh just to say that there will be a feedback form that will come up on your screen once you leave this webinar and um, it'll be emailed to you tomorrow as well. I'd really appreciate it if you could send that in. So all I've got left to say now really is to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, the presentation and the questions have been recorded and they'll be on Habiki Cumbria's YouTube channel tomorrow. And um, as I said, we'll answer every other question that hasn't been asked uh, as well. So yes, thank you all very much and good night all.